So last week I began with the definition of etymology. Etymology is the study of words. It's the study of the linguistic and the root and history of words. And so this message today is not strictly about the history of words, but to understand why we say what we say and how we say it, we have to know what words are all about. And so last week I told you that in the English language, we currently have an approximate number of about 170,000 words that are available to us to use to be able to communicate. And I said this last week, I use at least 100, maybe to 150 of those to get my language across. I don't think that I'm an expert with language, but I love the study of language. I love the fact that we live in a community where there are literally all hundreds of languages that are spoken in this area around the DMV. And you know what's really cool about languages is that it doesn't matter what language you speak, when it is basically interpreted into another language, we're saying the same things. We're using the same words just through different language. And we found out last week that the root of the English language comes from two Uh, Older languages, 75% of our words come from the Latin and 25% of our words come from the Greek language. So we know that our language is steeped in history and that there's a lot of richness in the words that we use and that there were real thinkers that brought about how our language is developed and how we speak every day. When we understand the origin of our words, it helps us to know why we say what we say, and why we say it in the way that we do. Communicating as clearly and as accurately as possible really is the cornerstone of every civilization. doesn't matter the language. It's important that we understand that communication is how we're going to get someone else to see the picture. We draw a picture with words. We can draw. How many of you have ever watched a movie and you got so intently into the movie it became real to you and you started crying, you started laughing, you actually, your heart started racing because of the words and the the screen was drawing you in to make that a reality. That's how it is when we speak to one another. We draw pictures and words and create people in their minds to be able to follow what we're communicating. Now, it's one thing not to have a grasp on a definition or to use words inaccurately. How many of you do that every now and then? You'll be speaking along and out of your mouth and the sentence comes and you realize that's not what I was supposed to say, right? We all do that. We all botch language. doesn't matter what language it is. So it's one thing to botch it or, or to not have the grasp on the definition, but it is a whole other issue when a slice of society wants to redefine our speech wants to take these words steeped in history and begin to change their actual definitions and distort this generation's perspective of a moral compass. To be able to point straight north to what is right and to what is wrong. We have an a underlying current that is working overtime to, to pollute language, to cause language to become corrupt that's thousands of years old, and to support an agenda of immorality and corruption. And look, this isn't just a slippery slope. It's more than a slippery slope. It's the trickery of the enemy to indoctrinate a generation, twisting their viewpoints away from God. This is all about getting away from morality. It's all about getting away from who God is and what he has set up as a standard for our lives. So I began a two-part series last week titled The Right Perspective. We built this on top of the scripture, Isaiah chapter 5 and verse 20 through 25. Everybody say these first two words, one, two, three. For those who say wrong is right, darkness is light, and bitter is sweet. What an amazing headline from thousands of years ago that's so accurate today. Where people are trying to take words and twist them to tell us, hey, really what's wrong is right and what's dark is really light and what's bitter is sweet. How many of you know that's actively happening right now in our nation? 
Isaiah goes on to say, It will not go well for them who think they are so clever and so smart. I'm sorry, but the only thing that can come up out of my mind is educated fools all over the television trying to convince us that what they're saying is so smart. And this is what I know on the backside of those television shows and all of this media entourage that's coming at us unbelievable like a machine gun. On the backside of that, they leave those studios and go down to the bar and they laugh while they're having their drinks to think that people would even believe the things that they're saying. Isaiah goes on to say, little do they know they're in for, everybody say it, big trouble. Now this is the point. For they have thrown away the laws of God and despised the word of the Holy One. This is exactly what's going on. When you begin to say wrong is right and dark is light and bitter is sweet, you're throwing away the words of the Holy One. You're despising the very words that God has given us upon which we build the foundation of our lives. Evil is working overtime to skew our young people's perspective. To skew their perspective into believing, listen, that their choice, any choice, whatever the choice is, it's okay. You just go right on ahead and choose. Well, I got a message. It's not okay. It's not okay for young people to think that they can begin to choose what gender they are. It's not okay for you to call my wife, who's a mother, a birthing person. That's not okay. She's not a birthing person. When we start using these words, we're confusing in the minds. And let me say this. It's not so much this adult population that's going to have a problem. It's the ones on the other side of this wall that they're after. And it's up to the church and it's up to families to ensure that this generation does not lose their perspective of what God has said. We have a responsibility as the church, and it's not okay. I want everybody to say that on the count of three. One, two, three. It's not okay. Evil's working overtime. The church has to wake up for the woke. We're the answer. Jesus is the answer to the emptiness they're trying to fill with this language. So last week I had three points, and I'm going to show them real quick. Number one was watch out, which we just read out of Isaiah, for those who say wrong is right. My second point was stay focused so that you will make sensible choices and speak with knowledge. My third point is the big picture. It takes more than the body demands to live a real everyday life of faith. What does that mean? The scripture we supported that with is... Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word. You see, the body demands a lot of things. The mind and the soul can demand a lot of things. If I was to write that scripture, I would say man cannot live on Krispy Kreme alone. But on every what? Word that comes from the mouth of God so that I can have an everyday life of faith. So my first point this morning is pie. Well, we might not be able to live on bread, but we can live on some pie. Come on, somebody. That's an acronym for something we're very familiar with. Perspective is everything. How have you heard that term? Perspective is everything. We're preaching or teaching on the right perspective. You cannot have a perspective until you've used your perception. Your perception is how you receive a perspective. That word perception is to become aware of something through the senses. Our five senses help us perceive things so that we can understand them. But our five senses can trick us sometimes. Come on, somebody. Have you ever had your five senses tell you one thing and it was really in contrary to what the Word of God said? Anybody? So we've got to make sure that the five don't trick us and that we listen to the one, the Holy Spirit. But our perception does come through the five senses. And through those five senses, we get a perspective of what's going on around us. Over in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 22, it says, The eye is the light for the body. 
Now, we know that people that are blind and cannot see, they live in darkness. There, there is, a, there is a, a phenomenon where they don't know uh, when, when it's day or when it's night, and they get their sleep habits mixed up, and they literally have to have a doctors help them so that they keep their sleep habits right because they're constantly in darkness. Well, Jesus isn't just talking about the natural eye. He's actually speaking to a crowd about your spiritual eye. And he said, your eye, your spiritual eye is a light for the whole body. Then he goes on to say, for if your eyes are good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are evil, your whole body will be full of darkness. In other words, what you're perceiving, what you're bringing into you will become your perspective. What you feed on is what you're going to talk about. What you look at is what your mind is going to think about. What you listen to is what the thoughts that are going to run through your mind. He goes on to say this, and if the only light you have is really darkness, then you have the worst kind of darkness. So what is he saying? When you have the light of God's word in you, your whole body's full of light. But when you with your eye are bringing in words that aren't the word of God, that are twisted from a woke society, you're now full of darkness. And if your darkness is your light, it's the worst kind of darkness. We've got to learn That all these words that are trying to steal our young people's minds are darkness. I have more people telling, parents telling me, you know, I'm, I'm having to put my child into a private school because I, I'm concerned about them being in a public school. And you know what they're concerned about more than anything? They're not concerned about PE. They're not concerned about lunch. They're not concerned about art. They're concerned about the words. Come on, somebody. They're concerned. They're actually concerned about teachers going outside of their lesson plans. They're concerned about what's going to be said that is not education. It's indoctrination. Is there anybody in this room today? They're concerned about their children being indoctrinated rather than educated. Because of words. And, there, and, and what happens is, is darkness comes into a classroom and now children are confused. Because we're telling them that's where they learn. That word good, where it said if your eye is good. That word good is the Greek word haplous. Which means single. Singleness of purpose keeps us from a divided heart. So really, Jesus was saying, if your spiritual eye is single in purpose, you'll be full of light. But if if your eye is evil, it will be a divided heart between good and evil, and that's the worst kind of darkness to have on the inside of you, to not know what is right and what is wrong. When your perception is single in purpose, you have the perspective, right, the right perspective of an undivided heart. See, my wife and I, we were separate. We were single individuals. And I looked at her and said, that is good stuff over there. And I said, I, I, I don't, I don't want to go on without you. And she looked at me and she said, I don't want to go on without you either. <laughs> and so we got married and we were two separate people, but then we became, everybody say it, we're one. We have singleness of eye for each other. So when I leave the house, she's not concerned about what I'm looking at here. She's not concerned about what I'm looking at on my phone. She's not concerned about what I'm looking on uh, on the computer, unless I'm on Amazon buying stuff. She's concerned. But she's not concerned that my eyes are wandering from her. And I'm not concerned about her eyes wandering from me. I mean, as sexy as we are. Hmm. We have singleness of mind. We don't have a divided heart. Come on, somebody. And let me tell you how you fix your problems. You get singleness of eye, and you keep your eye on Jesus, and you keep your eye on the Word, and all those habits and those addictions and those things you shouldn't be doing, they'll just fade away because no longer are you divided in what you're doing. 
James chapter 1 and verse 8 says it this way. A double-minded person is unstable in all of their ways. Now, we're not talking about, uh, about us in relationship. We're talking about our relationship with God. That it has to be single in eye, single in purpose. And I tell you what, we've got to stay with the word of God and what he said. See, this, this double-minded person, they have divided loyalties and divided allegiances. They're double-minded. They're easily swayed with doubt and uncertainty. And when you're like that, it's the opposite of being a God follower. It's the opposite of being a Christian who's standing on a rock that's solid. You don't go with every wishy-washy thing, and you don't listen to the changes in culture, and all of a sudden you have to change to be cool with the culture. So we said this we, last week. We used the definition of perspective. What is perspective? It gives the right impression. The, right per, the, the perspective gives the right impression of height, width, depth, and position in relation to each other when viewed from a particular point. Well, my particular point is the word of God. What is yours? See, and you're going to get in a discussion with me. I said this last week. I'm, I'm a spiritual person, but I like natural things. Somebody said to me, you know, I've, I, somebody said to me, I'm like, keep preaching this, Pastor. We really need to hear it. I said, well, it's dangerous to preach this in this society. I said, it's either that or race motorcycles. I said, they're both dangerous, and so I'll just keep doing this. See, the thing is, is that we understand that if you're going to choose a viewpoint, I get to choose, don't I? And I choose what the Word says. And I choose what God says. And that's going to help me to make sure that when words are said and twisted, I can line them up and say, no, that's not what God said. My wife's not a birthing person. She's a mother. You understand? I don't care who says it. I don't care how many followers they have on Twitter or how many Instagram followers they have. They're all being led. The Bible says the blind will lead the blind into the ditch. Somebody's got to be able to see. My mama had it straight, you know. She told me, she said, son, we're both men. God created humans. Not hum women's and humans. We're all part of the human race. She said, the only difference between you and me is I'm the man with the womb. Womb man. You didn't know that's why you were called a woman. It's because you have a womb. Now, I'm going to ask a question. Quick poll. All the men, this is for you. How many of you have a womb? Uh-huh. How many of you women have a womb? Some of you are not. What does he mean, a womb? What's he... <laughs> What's he talking about? Ladies, you are man 2.0. You're smarter than us. Come on, ladies. And you're, you can, you're the only ones who can carry another human. Another human. And whether or not they have a womb or not, we'll find out when they're born. I remember one preacher said, you know, he was, he was, they told him he was going to have a girl, but he was believing for a boy. And when the boy, when the boy, when the girl was born, he wanted a boy so bad, he told the doctor, he said, step back, doctor, you're about to see a miracle. <laughs> now, how many of you know, you know what I mean? She continued to be a girl because she was born a girl. And see, see how quiet it gets right now? Do you know why it gets quiet? Because of what society's trying to do. I'm telling you, the church has got to stand up right now. This is the moment that the church stands up. This is the moment that the church, for our next gen, it's not about you. It's about those kids on the other side of the wall. I don't want them confused. Parents, how many of you do not want your children confused as to who God made them or the purpose he made them for? 1 Corinthians Chapter 2 and verse 8 says, No eye has seen, no ear has heard, and no mind has imagined the things that God has prepared for those that love Him. How many of you love God in here? Come on, how many of you love Him with everything that's in you? The Bible says, Your eye has not seen, and your ear has not heard, and your mind can't even imagine. As far as I'm concerned, this is a bummer scripture. That means I'm never going to know. But wait, there's more. 
Read the next scripture. But God has revealed to the, those things to us by his spirit. You see, it's not about your perception from your five senses. It's about what the spirit is causing you to perceive so that your perspective is right. God has things planned for us we can't even imagine. He's got things our eyes have never seen, our ears have never heard, and he's revealing them to us by his spirit. How do you thank God for the Holy Spirit in your life that's showing you things the world is trying to find an answer? but they're doing it through twisted means. You and I have a path to the king. And you know what we become? We become the light in darkness. The Bible says we're a city on a hill that cannot be hid. We're a candle in a room that brings light to the world. This goes on to say, for the spirit searches everything, even the deep things of God. So when it says he's going to show us things, He's going to take us into the deep end. Come on, somebody. Look at this in another, another translation. It says the Holy Spirit shows us all God's deepest secrets. Anybody interested in God's deepest secrets? When we find out what God has said, we need to hold on to that with value and don't let the world steal it because they want to change words so that they're free to sin so that they're free to have debauchery. Because we have a generation that's watching. I said this last week that I heard of a Christian school in Florida that opened its doors, and I think it had 500 slots or something like that, and they had over 3,000 applications. Because people want their children to hear light and not darkness. Come on, somebody. God is calling the church to have singleness of eye. The word revealed in this scripture is God exposing to us what our five senses can't perceive. It's Paul referring to our spiritual perception. The deep things of God that he refers to gives us the perspective of the important things to God. You know what? I've just decided if it's important to God, it's important to me. I've, I've went ahead and decided if it's important to him, it's important to me. Do you know it's important that your neighbor knows Jesus before they die? Come on, somebody. It's important that your, your friends, the friends of your children, if they come around your house, it's important they see godliness in your home. Come on, somebody. That they hear. Listen, my mama, again, my mama had nine children. Can you imagine how many friends... We're coming through the house with nine children. Every one of them, if you came to my house, you were getting saved. Every one of my friends got saved in my house. Just the other day, when, when Larry was up here, how many of you were here for the, uh, the, the uh, what do you call that? He got, engaged, he got engaged, I think, right? How many of you were here? What was that called? A proposal? What do they call that? Something like that. How many of you were here for that? Was that not heartwarming? But he, listen, Larry has only been coming to the church a little over a year. And he, listen, he invited over a hundred people to that day. And you know what? About 50 or 60 of them showed up. He filled that entire section. Oh yeah, I'm shaming you. How many people have you brought to church? And those people, the majority of them weren't church people. And they had to, to, to watch the proposal, they had to listen to me preach. And the point I'm making is, is that how many of you know when you gain the right perspective, you want everybody you around you to know. And Larry is wanting everybody to know. Well, one of the people who came was a friend of Pastor Tony's. You know, uh, uh, Tony the Baptist? He was a friend of Tony the Baptist in high school. They went to school together. He came for Larry's water baptism and proposal, and we saw him afterwards, and you know what he said to me? He said, I got saved in your kitchen by your mom. He said, your mom led me to the Lord when I was a teenager. I said, that's my mama. 
How many of you know she had the right perception? And it affected other people. Perspective is everything. And our perception defines our reality. Let me give you this quote. Your reality is as you perceive it to be. So it is true that by altering our perception, we can alter our reality. Just because you perceive something to be a certain way doesn't mean it's true. Let me ask you a question. How many of you would be honest with me and the devil himself tortures you with thoughts about yourself? Come on, be honest. He he tells you you're nothing, you're nobody. He just, three of you. The rest of you are just, what, above everyone else in the world. How many of you have troubled thoughts about yourself? Be honest. Put your hand up. Thank you. Now you're going to heaven for being honest. But see, how do you know the enemy is trying to give you a perception of yourself to beat you down? But you can alter your perspective and your perception. You can change the reality of who you are. Look over here in Ephesians. We looked at this last week. This was Paul. He said, I pray that you will, everybody say it, perceive the extravagant dimensions of Christ's love. See, Paul, how do you know Paul was trying to change perspective through what they perceived? He said, you know what? I know where you are. I know you're troubled. I know the enemy's after you. I know you don't feel good about yourself. I know you're depressed. I know you're sick. But let me say something. I want you to perceive something different than what you're experiencing. And I want you to perceive God's extravagant dimensions, which is perspective, how wide, how long, how high, how deep that love is. Has anybody ever tried to tell somebody that you know just how much God loves them? And it's hard for them to receive it because they know how bad they've been. But how many of you know God's love is higher? God's love is wider. It's deeper. It's longer than any sin that's in people's lives. When he said he wanted you to perceive this, this is what he was saying. I want you to lay hold with your mind to be fully capable of comprehending The Word of God has the power to alter our perception to see as God sees rather than the way the enemy wants us to see. So number one, perspective is everything. Number two, we get a new way of thinking when our perception changes. Harry Bermeers said this, and I want you to get this. The collision between a Christian mind and a solidly earthbound culture ought to be a violent one. Let me read it one more time. The collision between a Christian mind and a solidly earthbound culture ought to be a violent one. They ought to be so opposed to each other that there's no way they can intertwine. Now that's not to say that we're supposed to get violent We don't have Humvees that are up armored out there with military uniforms and summits all over the Humvees and we're going to drive into D.C. and become violent. That's not what we're going to do. This is a spiritual perspective. I'll tell you how we can become violent in the spirit. We protect our children. We say absolutely. We go to war for our kids. We go to war for the minds of the people that are close to us. And we say, you know what? You might be solidly earthbound in your culture, but my God, my child's going to have the mind of Christ. My child is going to believe what the Bible says. My child's going to know who they are. Proverbs 23, verse 7 says this. For as a man thinks in his soul, so is he. As you think, so you are. Why do you think the world's after your kid's thinking? Why do you think he's after young people's thinking? Because when you think something, you think you are that even though you're not. When we start telling people that a he is a she and a she is a they and a they is a he is a she is an it. I don't know, even though, I, I mean, I'm going to offend somebody because I don't know about how to fix all these pronouns. All I know is I see a woman, I say, what's up, girl? I see a guy, I say, yo, dude, what's up? I wouldn't know to call you a dude it. 
See how quiet it gets in here? And the reason it gets this way is because I'm going against culture right now. I got a question. Am I in culture or, or am I in church? Where am I today? Am I in the midst of culture or am I in church? Because this is the only entity we have that will represent the kingdom of God. This is it. This is the only place God gets to speak. Come on, somebody. Then we go out of here. And outside these four walls, we get to change the culture because our perception is not by our five, it's by the one which changes our perspective. And now we can talk people into who Jesus is in their life. How many of you know people need to be free? Whom the Son has set free is free indeed. This person right here, the man who thinks in his soul, so is he. You know what he really is? He's a calculated person. And the words that he says really mean one thing, but his intentions are contrary to his words. I just told you that the, that the media on television put out all of these talking points, talking points, talking points. Then they turn the cameras off and they go and laugh behind the scenes of the junk they're trying to brainwash us with. Turn that mess off. Some of you in this room, you can tell me more about uh, the NFL football teams and you can name every person on the roster of every team and you can even tell me their stats and how good they are, but you can't quote three scriptures. Now, I don't care if you can know all those stats, but you need to have just as much scripture in you as you do NFL information. I had three women amen me, and all the men are like, what's up? (laughs) My mama loved baseball. She had four televisions in her house. Baseball season, all four televisions were turned on to watch the Orioles. You walked in her house, and you'd say, hey, mom, shh, I'm watching ball. But how much have I told you about my mom and her spiritual life? Her spiritual life was way more important than baseball, and it didn't matter. But listen, when commercials came on, she'd preach the gospel. When the ball game came back on, shh. See, she could live in both worlds, but she was more spiritual than she was natural. Is there anybody in here today? Am I all by myself? You shouldn't be be more consumed with what's on political television, and that's all you're talking about. It's okay to know and to be informed, but the Word of God needs to override political and everything else. And we need to be able to say, you know, as a man thinks in his soul, so is he. You know what I think in my soul? I think God's the biggest thing that I need to be thinking about. And when I do, I know who I am. Come on, somebody. I'm not confused about my gender. I'm not confused about my pronouns. I'm not confused that I have a birthing person that lives in my house. Our culture's way of thinking often confuses love and tolerance. And the two couldn't be more different. You need to tolerate. You, know, you don't have any tolerance. Listen, let me just explain something to you. Love seeks the other person's good. Tolerance seeks to be thought of as good in other people's eyes. When we're being tolerant, think about the word, I'm just tolerating that. Think about that word. It's a negative word. To tolerate something. That means you're putting up with it. Man, your next door neighbor, listen, listen to the way how loud that music is next door. Yeah, we just tolerate it. Why do you tolerate it? Because you don't want to go over there and start a war. Come on, somebody. So you're trying to be patient, and at night you need to go snip the wires on their speakers. You're tolerating. Listen, we're not here to tolerate one another. Jesus said to love one another. Come on, somebody. He said to love one another as I have loved you. You want to deal with racism? I just dealt with it. There's no way that I can be racist or feel that somebody is different from me when I love them like Jesus loves them and they love me back. Listen, it's not about all of that. All of a sudden, we're all created in his image. We're all created in his image. Red, yellow, black, white, green, pink. I'm pink, more of the pinky color. Then when I get in the sun, I turn bright red, and then I go pink again. Man, I don't have to tolerate 
I love people. I love being in other countries and being in other cultures and being around people. You know what I see every single time I've traveled the world? Every single time, you know what I've seen? The love of God go into people. And they weep and they break down just like they do here. In Asian countries and African countries and European countries. I see it with my own eyes. The same love of God breaks barriers down no matter where you are. I've preached in nations where they didn't understand one word I was saying, but the love of God came through. They perceive something. Come on, somebody. Love comes from fearing God. Tolerance comes from fearing man. Nowhere in the scripture is tolerance viewed as a virtue. It's why we anchor ourselves in God's word and not in this corrupt, broken system of the world. We don't anchor ourselves in what the media says. We don't anchor ourselves in what the government says. We anchor ourselves in the word of God. We're going to go back over to the book of Ephesians. Chapter 4, it says, Throw off the old evil nature, the old you, that was a partner in your evil ways, rotten through and through, full of lust and shame. When the Bible says throw off, it's speaking about your evil nature being just like a coat. Now, my microphone is connected to this coat, so I can't throw it off or the mic will rip off my head. But when I get home, I'm going to throw off this coat because I have been hot all day long. But when I take this coat, I'm going to throw it to the side and I'm going to have a different feeling on my body. It's not going to hang here anymore. But the Bible says we're to throw off our evil nature just like you throw off a coat. The old you, and it explains all that. Then it says, now your attitudes and thoughts must all be consistently changing. Everybody say this word for the better. Well, how are we going to have the right thoughts if the words were twisted? And they're turned into something that they don't originally mean. And I don't even realize who you are or what kind of denomination of person you are. No, I've got to stay with what language means. Now, let me just make this clear. And I said this last week. There is some language that needs to go. Demeaning language. uh, Anything that is racial and, 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 and pulls people down or judges people because of things that have to do with social Levels of life, there's no reason for all. I'm not talking about those words. I'm talking about the foundational bedrock of our language that I can no longer, I'm concerned how I identify you. Yes, you must be a new and different person, holy and good. Everybody say these two words, one, two, three with his new nature. See, you take off one coat and put on another. You take off the old way of thinking and you put on the new way of thinking. You clothe yourself. That, that word to clothe yourself is in, is in duo, is the word in duo. It means to put on and to be arrayed with. I want you to think about uh, a king when he receives his, his robe and his crown and his scepter. There's no mistaking who he is because a minute ago he was in normal clothes. But when he puts on and he arrays his royal robe and he puts his crown on and he has his scepter, you absolutely know he's clothed and you refer to him as the king. And thus it is with you when you became born again. You threw off the old nature and put on God's nature. And now people need to identify you through this new nature you're arrayed with the love and the attitudes of God. What happens? Our attitudes and thoughts are changing for the better. I should be better next week than I am this week. I should be better next year than I am right now in my walk with God. It's called a new way of thinking. Let me read you another quote. When you wake up every morning, have in mind that you were created to overcome anything in this world. I don't even know that's new thinking. That means the minute you step out of bed, you know what? I'm more than a conqueror today and there's nothing the enemy will throw at me that I can't overcome. There's nothing that I will face today that I will face alone. How many of you have the Holy Spirit with you? How many of you know you are not alone? I am not alone. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. 
See, if I had that attitude, I have a new way of thinking. You know, some people get up and think, man, I'm so depressed. This is going to be awful. I'm going to have to face so-and-so. They make me feel so bad. How many of you know they're already defeated before they get out the door? You need to be encouraged and know that God is with you before you get out the door. We're going to go over here in Isaiah chapter 26, verse 3. It says, God will keep in perfect peace all those whose minds are what? Stayed on him. Your mind is supposed to be what? Well, if you stay, you don't leave. How many of you have ever had relatives come stay at your house and you wish they'd leave? They just kept staying and staying and staying. Right? The Word of God needs to stay and not leave. And the Bible says when your mind is stayed on them, you'll have what? Perfect peace. How do you want you some perfect peace? That means even in the midst of all of this turmoil that's going on around us, I'm singleness of I. Perspective is everything. I have a new way of thinking. And my third point, study how Jesus did it. This is how we get there. This is how we fulfill everything I just said. Study how Jesus did it. Look what it says over here in Colossians chapter 3. It says, if you're serious about living this new resurrected life, with Christ. How many of you are serious about it? Come on. How many of you are serious about what I'm talking about here? What's the next three words? Everybody? Act like it. Look up and be alert to what's going on around Christ. That's where the action is. I want you to read this last line. One, two, three. See things from his perspective. Now, how many of you know that if you're going to go change words and change language and you're going to try to force me into something that's woke, how many of you know it can't be God's perspective? So I've got to stay with this perspective. Because I'm supposed, to, I'm supposed to look up. Everybody shout, look up. look up. I want everybody to look up right now. Everybody look up, look up, look up, look up, look up, look up. Everybody look up. Keep looking up. Don't look at me. How many fingers do I have up? Oh, man, I saw one of you look right at me when I said that. You didn't know how many fingers I had up. Do you know why? You were paying attention to what God is doing. Come on, somebody. You look up. And you see things from his perspective. And then my fingers or my language will not confuse you. Come on, somebody, because you got your eyes in the right place. In 1992, the Olympic Games were held in Barcelona. One of the Olympic swimmers, her name was Summer Sanders, and she emerged from those Olympics in 1992 as the most decorated U.S. swimmer in Olympic history. She won two golds, a silver, and a bronze Metal. Well, she made this statement, and I thought it kind of fit. Not that it's spiritual, but she made this statement. I thought it was a good quote for us today. She said, to be a champion, she must know something about being a champion, you must have, you have to know it's not about winning and losing. It's about everyday hard work and about thriving on a challenge. I am challenging you today. To stand with the word of God and have singleness of eye no matter what the culture is doing. Protect your children at all costs. Accept the challenge. It's about embracing the pain that you will experience. Come on, somebody say amen. At the end of the race and not being afraid, I think people get afraid of certain challenges. Everybody shout out, I'm not afraid. Shout it out. I'm not afraid. afraid. -ah. (laughs) Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 2, it says, Keep your eyes on Jesus, who both began and finished this race that we're in. She just talked about racing, didn't she? And she said, it's not about winning and losing. It's about accepting the challenge and realizing that if you accept the challenge, you're going to win. Understand there's going to be pain. I don't even know there's pain in the middle of the race. But you know you're going to be in pain before you get in pain, and you're going to face the pain because you're going to finish the race. Look what it says. Keep your eyes on Jesus who began and finished. He's already been there. Study how he did it. You want to know how to do this? You study him, and it's going to tell us. Look what it says. Because he never lost sight of where he was headed, that exhilarating finish in God. And I put this in because he kept the right perspective. He could put up with anything along the way, cross, 
shame, whatever, and now he's there in the place of honor right alongside God. When you find yourself fledging along in your faith, go over that story again, item by item, that long litany of hostility he plowed through, and that will shoot adrenaline right into your souls. If he did it, I can do it. He empowers me because he's already been there. Let's get God's perspective on this world we live in. Not the world's perspective on the world we live in. He's above all. And with all that's going on around us, God is thinking about you. How many of you believe that? That God is thinking about you. Would you lift one hand and thank him right now? Thank him that he's thinking about you. And that you are right now accepting the challenge of the right perspective. Thank you, Jesus. Can somebody shout amen and give him some big praise in here? Come on. We're so glad that you joined us on Summit TV today. Thank you very much for your ongoing obedience to God and financial support. Your giving allows Summit Church to reach out to local, national, and international communities. If you'd like to give to Summit, click the Give link in the description box.